Hello, welcome back to our channel. So I'm Maria and if you're new around here, we're delighted to have you. And if you don't already, you can hit subscribe, you'll be able to stay up to date with everything that's going on around the farm. We got a couple of questions about like our system of farming, things like how many cows do you milk and just questions like that. So we said we'll put together a video and we'll explain everything to do with our farm. And then we'll go through things like our breeding policy, um, grass system here, our income streams, just different things like that. If there's a topic that you're particularly interested in and that's all you want to hear about, what I'll do is I'll put the topics and their times in the description box below so you can just skip on to the topic that you want to know more about. I'll just give a brief overview of dairy farming in Ireland first for any of you who maybe aren't farmers or who aren't from Ireland. If you're a dairy farmer and you're from Ireland, you can probably skip this section because you'll know it all anyway. Basically, because of our relatively non-extreme climate in Ireland, uh, we're very lucky that we have the ability to grow grass. So we typically get a lot of rain. We haven't really got a lot of rain in the last few weeks, but we usually get a lot of rain and that makes then for ideal grass growing conditions. So cows can typically be outside from about February or March up until November or December. So this will depend where in Ireland your farm is, but just generally speaking, that's usually the grazing season. So because grass is the main feed source of the majority of dairy cows in Ireland, then usually the size of your herd will depend on the amount of grassland that you own and the amount of grass that you can grow on your farm. So how that applies to our farm then is we currently milk 140 cows on 126 acres or 51 hectares of a milking platform and then half of that is owned and half of that is leased. Your milking platform then is basically any fields that you can walk your cows to from the yard. We then have a 45 acre or 18 hectare out farm and we use that for cutting grass silage and we also rear our young stock on it as well. So our overall stocking rate on our farm then will be two and a half livestock units to the hectare, which is kind of like the old rule of thumb of one cow to the acre. The farm was originally purchased by Podrick's parents in the 90s. They were both school teachers and they farmed dry stock and tillage here. And then after that, they had a suckler herd then up until 2013. So that was when Podrick came home after studying ag science in UCD and being abroad and working here in Ireland. So that was when they converted the farm to Darien. Both of Podrick's parents are retired from teaching now, um, but Podrick's dad is still very, very active on the farm and he's a great help altogether. When they started out with the dairy farm, Podrick used his savings to upgrade the grazing infrastructure on the farm. So he would have prioritised roadways and a water system because he knew that this is what was going to give him the greatest return in those first couple of years rather than concrete and steel. And then with the sale of the suckler herd, they bought 45 in-calf heifers from two local farmers. They milked in a temporary six unit milking parlour um, in the old Sattage shed for the first two years. Then in 2015, with the help of a 40% grant from the Department of Agriculture, a new milk and parlour was built. So a 14 unit milk and parlour was installed and then that was upgraded then to a 20 unit with ACRs in 2017. If you'd like to know more about the milk and parlour, we have a tour and a milk and routine video done. So I'll put the links for them down below. And then in 2016, again with the help of a 60% grant this time from the Department of Agriculture, a new cubicle shed was built. And that can be seen in the first part of our farm tour. I'll stick the link down below for that. So the same year that the shed was built we were very fortunate that we got the opportunity to lease additional ground and that doubled the size of our milking platform and allowed us then to grow the herd. So the herd has increased from 45 heifers in 2014 up to 140 cows which is what we milk today. So on the farm Paul Rigg, myself and his dad are full-time. In August 2018, Podrick and I were married and that's when I joined them on the farm full time. And we've also been very fortunate that we've had the help of some super young people on the farm. So they help us at particularly busy times of the year with calving and silage and different things like that. Currently, there's nobody else on the farm with us at the moment because of the ongoing health crisis. Hopefully it won't be too long before they'll be able to come back. So another major role on our farm is contractors. Again, we've been absolutely blessed with fantastic farm service providers that do the majority of our machinery work for us. AB Contracting looks after our slurry spreadings silage 
um, receiving different jobs like that. And then we have contractors for other jobs in the farm like haulage, hoof care, hedge cutting, AI. It sounds really like we do very little actually when you, when you think about it. The main reason I suppose that we do rely so much on contractors is because it allows us to concentrate then on the cows and the grass. So they would have the expertise and the top quality equipment to do the job and they'd be able to complete it over a number of farms in the area. Moving on to milk, the main reason why we're even here. On our farm, our cows are milked twice a day. They're milked at six o'clock in the morning and then they're also milked at three o'clock in the evening. The milking process takes anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours. So there's usually two people milking. One person will go out for the cows or if we have the back latch on, they'll just go out and make sure that all the cows have come in from the paddock and then the other person starts milking. Like just for example, if Podrick and I are milking, he'll go on out for the cows, I'll start milking and by the time he comes back in, I could have two rows milk so it just makes the job a little bit more efficient and keeps it moving. Our milk is collected from our co-op Glambia every two to three days depending on the time of year so at the moment it's peak milk production so milk is collected every two days. When the milk is collected a bulk milk sample is taken and tested we get the results of that test texted to us and then at the end of the month we get paid then on the quantity and also the quality of our milk based on the results from those tests. Those tests provide like a picture of the whole herd, but then we milk record four to five times a year to get back specific information on each cow and the quality of her milk. So a milk sample is collected from each cow and it's sent off to a lab and it's analyzed and then we get the information sent back to us. We get back information on her butter fat, protein, somatic cell count. So those results will be used for breeding purposes, for analyzing if our grass is under control. So we'll change over now to the computer screen and I'll be able to show you our herd milk results over the past couple of years. So these are our herd milk results since the start of dairying in here. So as you can see here, this is the number of cows that were milked each year. And then I've also included the percentage of heifers that were in the herd because that will have an impact on milk yield. As you can see there in 2017, the milk yield per cow is lower and that's because the percentage of heifers in the herd had increased to 50%. Also, Podrick will discuss grass in the next section, but if you notice in 2018, we fed over a ton of meal um, because of the drought. And then we actually ended up with a lower milk yield than last year when we fed 800 kilos of meal. Now, 800 is still probably a little bit more than what we would like to feed. Despite feeding more meal in 2018, we still ended up with more milk in 2019. So it really kind of shows how grass is driving our output. So our main focus, I suppose, with the milk is keeping the milk constituents up. So the likes of our kilos of milk solids per cow, keeping our percentages up and also trying to keep our somatic cell count down. Okay, so Paul is going to do the grass section because that is his area of expertise and he's very good at it and I'd be only rambling and yeah I wouldn't know You're already starting to ramble <laughs> Yeah sure look at in terms of the grass uh, every day is a school day with it and um, I suppose I would have spent a bit of time in college learning about grass about I suppose the key aspects of grassland management in a grazing system. When I went out on work experience and then also worked with dairy farmers after college, honed in on the skills and brought the practice in with the theory. And then every year, I feel like, I suppose, you'd be getting more confident with it, but like, you'd still be making mistakes with it the whole time. And there's lots of, I suppose, variation with the grass and it's a, a lot of it's down to the weather. So you can have growth spurts and then you can have times where you have very low growth and you might have high demand and like in 2018 when we had the drought the main thing with it is we're measuring to manage it we're measuring using clippers quadrant and weighing scales what you're doing there is you're measuring how much grass is in the quadrant which is 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters you're using a formula and you're inputting the dry matter percentage to get it so that we'll be able to talk like for like with other farmers in terms of how many kilograms of dry matter there are per hectare this is the program that podrick uses when measuring the grass so he inputs the grass covers for each paddock and then this program will give him back the information about the overall grass situation on the farm. The paddock numbers are along the x-axis 
and then the cover in the paddock in kilograms of dry matter per hectare is what's along the y-axis here. You can use that information then to know how much grass you have on the farm so that you'll be able to make decisions on whether you have enough grass for the cows, whether you have to take out surpluses, whether you have a deficit coming up. Then I suppose you're also using the information at the end of the year or throughout the year, you're able to make reports so that you'll know which paddock's the highest performing, which one's the lowest performing, which one might require receding. I heard a guy before compare it kind of like with a banana in terms of the grass so if the banana is green like it's too ripe that's when your covers are too low and you don't want to be eating the banana at that stage <laughs> when you get to the point where the banana has gone black and is kind of you know shriveled up moldy. and moldy <laughs> that's when the covers are gone too high and it's yeah. not palatable three hours later you want to be getting in like you know when the banana's looking good <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't even i don't even eat bananas i don't like bananas this is why i'm no good at grass <laughs> so, so you know what you typically like that changes at the shoulders of the year you might accept higher grass covers so that you can extend the grazing season out longer because the the more grass that's in the paddock, grass grows grass. So the more you have in it, the more it's going to grow. But obviously at the shortest of the year, your growth is reducing because of the temperatures. You can manipulate the growth a little bit by letting the covers build up and creating kind of a wedge of grass that you can graze then on into the autumn. Similarly then in the springtime, you'll have a bank of grass that you will have built up at the end of the autumn that you'll carry over into the springtime and you'll start out with that then when you when you start calving. The reason why we're kind of spring calving then is we're matching the cow's demand with the peak grass growth. So we're kind of matching those two together as best we can. Then the surpluses that are made in the summertime are fed out then at the shoulders of the year in the wintertime. In times of deficit, you can come in with either meal or silage. Depending on the year again, between 400 kilos per cow of meal and about a ton of meal. Yeah, it you know, really we, depends on the year. Yeah, even actually we, we fed 1.2 ton, I think it was, during the drought year. Yeah. That would be about the most that we'd feed. I suppose in an ideal scenario, you'd be keeping the meal around 500 kilos of mm -hmm. meal per cow. In the year that we fed 1.2 ton of meal, we still didn't get the output that we got on another year with only 800 kilos of meal. So what's driving our output is grass. Meal is a lot higher cost. At best, it's only equal in the energy value of grass. So we're going to talk a little bit about breeding now. Um, this will be one of my favorite topics apart from like financial or organization or anything like that. Um, I love breeding. So, I'll be discussing EBI, which if you're not familiar with, is the economic breeding index uh, that we have here in Ireland. And it basically ranks every cow in the country against a base cow. And it tells you how much more or less profitable your cow should be per lactation compared to that base cow. The two main components of EBI are milk and fertility. The EBI is a very useful tool that we use when we're selecting bulls for our herd at breeding time. We don't keep any stock bulls here on the farm, mainly from a farm safety point of view, so it's all AI. We do have a couple of younger vasectomized bulls. Um, they're running with the herd at the moment. Our breeding season is currently about 10 weeks long and we usually start at the beginning of May. Cows have a nine month gestation length, so this should mean that they'll start calving at the start of February right through up until the start of April. So just go back a little bit, when Podrick first bought the 45 heifers, they would have been high EBI, uh, Holstein Frisian heifers. And then he stayed breeding kind of black and whites for a couple of years before trying a little bit of Jersey then on some of the cows. So since then, we've also added Norwegian Red to the lineup. So our herd currently is made up of about two thirds Frisians and then one third crossbred. And our current breeding policy is we're going for the three way cross. So the reason that we've picked those three breeds is because the Frisian you're starting off is a good solid base cow. Then we add in the Jersey because, so they would have really good milk constituents that also bring kind of a smaller, more robust type of an animal. And then we've added in the Norwegian Red because they bring the health traits then to the table and also things like good feet, good conformation. And with things coming down the line like selective dry cow therapy, a lot less antibiotic use on farms, um, we're trying to prepare ourselves for that and ensure that our herd is as healthy as possible. 
So we're also looking at crossbreeding from the point of view of hybrid vigor or heterosis. Basically this occurs when you cross two animals from totally different breeds. That particular animal should have superior performance compared to the average of their respective breeds. So it's another positive to crossbreeding but you can't necessarily I suppose quantify it into a euro value. So finally a topic I suppose that's important when you're discussing breeding is obviously we have 140 cows that calf here on the farm but we only need about 30 replacement heifers so there's 100 10 extra calves that are born but we keep any heifer calves that we need if we have any extra heifer calves um, like we did this year we sold them to a local farmer that's going to be getting into dairy in the next few years and then the dairy bull calves then the majority of them are sold either to local farmers or marks so we have a local farmer that purchases all of our crossbred bull calves and he rears them then to bull stage the rest of the calves that will be born on the farm will be beef bred animals the beef breeds that we would use on the farm will be angus Shorthorn, Limousine, Belgian Blue, and they'd also be sold directly either to local farmers or marts as well. We do have a few pieces of machinery. Mm -hmm. A few yeah, that are still a, going. We have a V8894 <laughs> tractor, a uh, Massey Ferguson 565 tractor, a Terex loader, and a Honda Quad. Mainly, what the tractor and the quad are used for is, as well as using the quad for getting in the cows, fertilizer. We spread all our fertilizer with the tractor and the quad. We have a fertilizer shaker for both half ton. We have a sprayer then for the quad for spot spraying. And then the other implements for the tractor is basically just a coon mower. In other bits of equipment, the Lely robotic scraper. Yeah. We went with that because we have all slatted passages. They're all parallel with each other. We have five of them. If we were to get in the ratchet scrapers it was going to cost more than the robotic scraper so yeah. it's kind of a no-brainer for us yeah. yeah so the only other piece of equipment sure is the milk cart it mixes up a uh, milk replacer but it also pumps out milk or milk replacer so it can hold about 160 litres it eliminates buckets from the calving season which is great so it makes um, feeding calves a one-person job yeah if you want to see the milk cart in action as well um, there's a video feed and clean with me the calf edition you can check that out and you'll see the milk cart then working <music> Right, so these are the KPIs for the farm over the past number of years. Some of them have improved, but some of them still need a little bit more work, but it's always good to have something to work on. Ideally, we'd like to bring the empty rate down to about 10% with 9 or 10 weeks breeding. It was a little bit high last year. We'd also like to keep the 6 week calving rate around 90% or maybe even a little bit higher if we could, as this will really impact then our days in milk and our overall milk results at the end of the year. Now, I could talk about the financials all day, but I did my best to keep it as straightforward as possible and not bombard you with too much information on it. So these are our basic financial results over the past number of years. And I've presented it in euro per kilo milk solids and also in cent per litre, depending on, on what format you might be used to looking at. So just a couple of things on the financials. The first year the project was in milk in 2014, that was a record milk price year. Hence, that's the reason for the high margin achieved. The subsequent years then, milk price began to crash. So 2016 was probably the worst for this. That year was when milk price began to sit around cost of production. Then it started to stabilise, but we were hit with the drought in 2018, which then led to an increase in cost of production. We were also married that year, so that may or may not have something to do with things. I know, I'm only joking. That's not a business expense at all. Personal drawings are not actually included in this cost analysis just to be able to compare like for like with other farms but all other hired labour is accounted for. So bringing it up to 2019 we've managed to bring the cost down to 24 cent per litre and it'll probably sit around there for the foreseeable future until we have more debt paid off. So just moving over to the graphs here our focus over the past couple of years was to maintain and minimise our cost while increasing production. So as you can see from the green bar here and here, the net profit in cent per litre or euro per kilo of milk solids was the largest. However, the litres produced were the lowest at 200,000 litres. With the increase in production, last year we supplied 800,000 litres. The actual net profit figure has also increased. Just to note as well, although milk is our main income stream, animal sales would contribute to our overall gross output or total income figure. And finally, in case you were wondering, none of this information is sensitive for us. We're not giving away any bank account passwords or anything like that. We would share all of this information with anyone that visits our farm. 
So at the start of every year, we normally sit down and we do our personal and our business goals. So I'll do mine personally and Patrick will do his and then we'll do like our family goals together. And then we also do goals for the business. We have broke then down the farm goals into short term and long term. And then what I suppose we specifically want our farm to look like in the future. So on the farm, our short term goals at the moment are to reduce our costs as much as possible, grow our equity and adapt to our new roles. And then our long term goals are to streamline the business um, match infrastructure to requirements and pay off debt. Sure. So for our short term growth, so our short term, short term, this farm was originally bought by I'm not sure I hear something. 